So the DAL E2 AI or algorithm has been fairly extensively covered already. And this is by no means a detailed breakdown or anything like that, but given that my invite has come through, I thought I'd at least give it a try and see what kind of results I get. Though I have, however, prepared a few talking points, just some things that I'd like to mention to give a broad overview. So as a bit of an introduction here, the DAL E2 is the second iteration, hence the two, and is developed by a company called OpenAI. And it's defined by its creators as an AI system that can create realistic images and art from a description and natural language. And a little bit on natural language here. That refers to language systems developed and used by humans. In other words, things like English, uh, some more local examples for me might include Afrikaans or Zulu or Oza. We have about a dozen certified or uh, recognized languages here in South Africa. So any of these can really apply, but generally you uh, Dull E accepts English. Those are, however, all examples of natural language systems. The second point is in reference to um, the second point is in reference to a, another AI system that's kind of similar to this, but much more specialized, referred to as thispersondoesnotexist.com. And what they do is they may train a machine model to look at thousands of faces and create an entirely new person. This is a shockingly realistic rendition of a person. And while some of them are not perfect, uh, they have a lot of, uh, some of them will have flaws and stuff like that that will make it quite easy to pick up and deduce whether or not this is actually a, a real life image or something that's just created by some kind of algorithm. However, that being said, a lot of them and to a certain extent, most of them are shockingly realistic to definitely fool the average person. I know if I was shown a, maybe half a dozen uh, selections of some really good examples, it probably would fool me as well. So that's quite impressive. Now Dal E or Dal E2 is similar to that, but is much more generalized. So Aditya Ramesh, a researcher and co-founder of Dal E1 and 2 and therefore OpenAI, describes Dal E2's Dal -E structure as a combination of two AI systems working together. These are referred to by him as Clip and Diffusion. Now, as for the purpose of Clip, this is uh, what relates text to images, right? It's all about building relationships, right? In the same way humans grow and expand their minds uh, from infancy into adulthood, essentially, these new ideas and these relationships are formed. Uh, and it, the AI, the algorithmic equivalent of this is, are sort of can be de uh, described as these uh, neural pathways, right? It's all about building relationships, right? In the same way humans grow and expand their minds and develop new ideas, uh, relationships and neural pathways are formed uh, in humans and in machines, these algorithmic pathways are developed. Uh, respectively. It's really quite a fascinating process how they managed to get these to work together. The most common example of this is an astronaut riding a horse, right? It's sort of the go-to when most people are describing uh, what DAL E2 does. And I, that's mostly because uh, it exhibits sort of the main primary functions of CLIP. Um, this neural engine uh, on some level begin has some kind of understanding of what a horse is, right? Uh, it also has uh, some kind of understanding on what an astronaut is, you know, the, the physique and characteristics of an astronaut, you know, the suit, the helmet, things like that. Uh, and to take that one step further, it also has, to some degree, an understanding of what the verb riding is, right? To take that one step further, the clip, um, al the clip algorithm that uh, relates these texts to images also has some kind of understanding of the idea of aesthetic, right? What humans will find what kind of imagery humans will find pleasing. And then furthermore, it has an understanding on how to, to execute said imagery. With Diffusion, however, I did about a dozen or two Python courses, and I was tasked with pulling a Diffusion and an OCR, or Optical Character Recognition API, uh, to pull text from images. Um, and this is where the Diffusion comes in. It was especially corrupted images. One of the prime examples I remember is an image of a storefront. Branding in the actual store was behind a pane of glass and the image was essentially corrupted. So what Diffusion was tasked with doing is uncorrupting that image so that the text could become so that the text could become readable and therefore be pulled down from the OCR API. Or well, the way these are trained is an image is taken, uh, a standard image is taken, and then it is then corrupted, right? It is pixelated and noise and distortion and things like that are introduced to make the image essentially incomprehensible or as close to anyway. 
it will then reverse that process and it repeats that cycle again and again and again with as many images and different kinds of variations as possible. And in that way, it can begin to understand uh, what corruption looks like. So it can then take an image that it didn't corrupt and uncorrupt it from there. This is taken one step further in dull E, where, and this is the basic level that, that I'm sort of interpreting it as, where by understanding how these images are essentially constructed, what makes them corrupt and things like that, it will then be able to assemble new images from scratch. And this is what it, uh, is actually used to build the image, right? So Clip will build the relationships between text and images, like how a human mind evolves to form new connections. And then what Diffusion will do is it will then reinterpret those images to create entirely new ones from that, because it's uh, trained itself to um, to distort and break images and then therefore unbreak them. It understands um, how they are formed. So we can therefore, so these will then work in tandem to create something entirely new based on what you feed it. The reason I find this process so fascinating, though I'm by no means a software developer or anything like that, so this is just a basic level understanding that I have on how this process works, is that I find something sort of innately beautiful, right, in the art of creation. Right, when you, uh, as a human, create something, you will find that your, um, your personal characteristics and things like that are sort of innately reflected in that creation, right? Um, so if you draw a piece of, uh, piece of art, your personal preferences and what you find aesthetically pleasing and what interests you will all contribute to creating something completely new. And it is sort of that process that they've managed to replicate in this algorithm that I find just absolutely wonderfully fascinating. So OpenAI defines its goal as, as to create good, safe, general AI, or a machine learning algorithm essentially. Since true artificial intelligence isn't actually anything that exists in the, the real world yet. Google has claimed, um, a researcher at Google claimed to come close or that they uh, cracked a, a truly sentient algorithm, but I don't believe that would pass the Turing test uh, because the person who alleged these claims sort of asked leading questions to try to in instigate uh, a specific response out of it. So I'll just refer to this as a machine learning algorithm, so a program without any true sentience. That being said, um, the level of execution that they've managed to achieve here is undeniably remarkable. Um, of course, there are, however, limitations, and I do have a few listed here, uh, classed into two categories, intentional and unintentional. Intentional are a little more obvious. Uh, you'll remember they defined their, OpenAI defined their goal as to create good, safe, general AI. So uh, it is for this reason that they've uh, artificially limited the ability to use identities such as real people, you know, part politicians, um, public identities, things like that. Um, it also prohibits the use of um, graphic images such as violence, adult content, illicit or illegal activities, uh, and other things like that. Again, refer to their mission, um, their mission's keyword being safe. Uh, and we'll see uh, another example come to this because I want to see what happens if I type in my username, Bazooka Panda. It has a bazooka in it that is a weapon. In a video uh, done by Marquez Brownlee, uh, he used the example of a teddy bear performing surgery on a grape, and instead of using a scalpel, right, um, standard surgical equipment, it replaced that with scissors, right, to be a more um, friendly version. Now, the other category, unintentional quirks. Um, again, Marquez, um, Marquez's video uh, has some absolutely ec excellent examples of this and I'll link that video just below the like button so you can go and check it out and see some of these examples as well. Uh, he speaks about something referred to as variable binding. I uh, interpret this as um, variables being uh, objectivity essentially, right? The variables that uh, a human presents to this algorithm um, in relation to position and things like that. One of the um, prime examples is a blue apple in a bowl of oranges. You'll find sometimes you'll find sometimes it'll present an orange in a bowl of blue apples, uh, which is a pretty um, neat quirk if you ask me. However, my favorite uh, manifestation of this is text, uh, text in signs, purely because of the sheer irony, right? This is an algorithm that takes um, text in natural languages 
and converts it into an image, right? But if you ask for text in that image, it'll start to get a little quirky. And I also have a few examples of this um, coming later on. Uh, there are many examples of this also floating around online of some just absolutely hilarious um, signs and things like that that uh, Dali has presented that just have no real conceivable meaning whatsoever, but uh, it's just hilarious to see what it spat out.